people find my page uh, very interesting that I will call people out. If you're not going to create any type of positive movement in making this better, your complaining without a solution is nothing more than whining. Mm -hmm. I don't want whiners on my page. Well, can you bring this? I'm like, that's a franchise. Mm. And guess what? You live in Midland, Texas, the land of opportunity. Go do it yourself. Yeah. Kevin, man, hey, thanks for coming by today. I uh, really appreciate it. Um, for those who don't know, uh, we got Kevin Dawson here, and he is a – your LinkedIn bio, man, it's a, it's pretty stacked. So you let's – let us let me make sure you – I got everything here. So first and foremost, you're a podcast host. Love that. Public keynote speaker. You're a author. Now you're – I mean, you're a filmmaker. You're a documentarian. Yeah. Right. Yeah. There's 300 other things <laughs> uh, listed that we'll get into, but um, how I sort of uh, came to hear about you and and sort of know who you are is through your wildly um, popular Facebook group, maybe maybe in Midland, Odessa. I had to do a lot of digging, man, because it was like kind of your behind the scenes kind uh, of like, guy. Are we even allowed to like talk about that? That's him. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. yeah we've, I've got I, like I, I finally got to the point where after doing my my TED talk last year, talking about the history of maybe in Midland, Odessa, like, all right, for four years there was no face yeah. to to the page, and and part of that was why I wanted that autonomy as I was doing all this work, and then after doing the TED talk, I was like, okay, I, I'm I'm a little bit more comfortable being in front of the the camera, mm -hmm. so to speak, of the page. And it has now gotten to a point where, you know, we're, we're sitting under 37,000 followers on that page. Wow. Uh, just this morning, a family entertainment event center company reached out to me and said, hey, who can we talk to about bringing a 200,000 square foot family entertainment complex to Midland? I'm like, well, you're talking to the right guy. Now, if you want funding for that, let me put you in <laughs> contact with at the MDC. Yeah. And, uh, and, and people are like, you know, they know who I am because of that page. And, and, and now it's like, okay, that page has evolved with me as, as I've evolved to now be a little bit more plugged in with what's going on in the city. Right. Um, it, to a point where people are like, you should run for office, mm -hmm. you know, this next time around. Because there are some people um, who are anti-development mm -hmm. still uh, kind of in, in elected positions. Uh, for whatever reason, and uh, it's like we're, it's time to keep make, making Midland go forward mm -hmm. uh, in, in a positive way, you know. And and as our average age and demographics have gotten younger, and we've got more families and wanting things to do, it, it's time for Midland to grow with it. Well, yeah, and having that younger voice is key to that because I'm gonna say we. I feel like you're younger than we are. But like we kind of have are more tuned in with like what our generations want. Yeah, I mean it's I mean, so like I'm I'm born and raised here, you know, it, which is funny to me when people are like, oh, you're a native Midlander, and like that's rare. I'm like, growing up, that was not the case. Like, yeah, Ryan, you being from Las Vegas, mm -hmm. <laughs> that's rare as a kid growing up. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And now and now it's like I'm the rarity, <laughs> right? <laughs> being being the native, and uh, but. With that change is like, okay, this the the people who have led over the last several decades, you know, they led from positions of of just trying to survive, mm -hmm. you know, with the economy and in the boom bust cycles that we've had. They're like, we've we've tried to survive, and and now we're at a place where, economically speaking, we're no longer in an exploration mode, but more of like a manufacturing city. Mm -hmm. You know, when you think about it, we're recovering oil we know it's going to be there for a long time mm -hmm. so economically speaking it's not going to be as drastic of the boom bust that you know the people who have been leading the cities um has over the last four decades and and, and that's starting to shift and mm -hmm. you can see that shift with people who are stepping up to be involved with city commissions and who are sitting on uh planning and zoning or mdc boards or even uh, a city council or or mayor now mm -hmm. you know that shift is is, is happening but right. there's still some of that old past that just oh we, we don't want this <laughs> yeah resist change okay so let's back up one second though just because i want to kind of understand one how this whole 
maybe in Midland Odessa came about. What is your what is your background? How did that then turn into you speaking um, at a TEDx event? Because yeah. I assumed your background was in like commercial real estate or something. I would go, I go, who is this guy and how does he have the insight of all of these places coming about? Yeah, so you know, I, I'm a proud, uh, like I said, born and raised here, so I'm pr- proud uh, MISD graduate and went to Midland High, graduated from Midland College twice. Go uh, dogs. Yes, go Bulldogs. <laughs> um, and, uh, and and went to Midland College um, after trying to figure out what I wanted to do. I mean, what I really wanted to do, I wanted to, to be a fighter pilot and wanted to go to the Air Force Academy. But life happened. Um, I became a, a teen dad uh, right as I was graduating high school. So, like, that changed things mm. up. And so I still wanted to really pursue aviation. It's still a big part of uh, who I am and part of that passion uh, projects that I have. And uh, so I went to Midland College when they had the professional pilot program. I was going to be a pilot. Well, going through school, Congress changed the, the, the laws that, that made uh, minimum hours go up. And, uh, and I didn't have enough hours. And I didn't want to chase, you know, working as a, a flight instructor making 20000 25000 a year when I was responsible for, uh, at that time, a two-year-old. Mm-hmm. And uh, trying to just make my own way. And uh, so I went back to Midland College, got my degree in organizational management, and worked for a couple of nonprofits um, around town, then got into oil and gas uh, through a a friend of mine who said, hey, we're looking for somebody in a a sales and marketing role to come work for a small family oil company. And so I went to work for them, which for me growing up, I didn't want to work in oil and gas. Your family I, business, nothing like no, that. No, no, not at all. To rebel. Yeah, I was. I was like, I don't want to stay stuck in this town. <laughs> like everybody else, I want to get out of here. I'm like, why would I work for the one industry that makes me stay here? And uh, and so I went to go work for this little oil company, and it was making good money. Um, but at that time, I'm like, okay, if I'm going to be here for a little bit, like I, I want to see some change, and. My, my middle brother was at, at tech at that time, and, and Facebook was starting to become more and more popular, more mainstream rather than just a college social media page. Okay. Mm-hmm. And there was a group of students at tech who had created a Facebook group called Bring Chipotle to Lubbock. Mm. And I'm like, oh, I like Chipotle. <laughs> uh, I mean, one of my childhood best friends, his family moved to Austin. And so we went and visited them. Um, it was like 2000. And uh, we go go down one weekend and, you know, the typical Texas thing to do is Sunday, you go morning, you go to church, and then you go out to eat afterwards. And his parents goes, hey, let's go. We're going to take you to this new Mexican place that just opened up around the corner. It's Chipotle. <laughs> and yeah. I'll, I'll walk in and go, that's just Mexican Subway. <laughs> right. <laughs> Pretty much. And uh, But I was like, okay, I want a burrito. So I'm like, this is the best thing I've ever eaten. And, and you know, I'm sitting here in 2000. I was 12 years old, and I'm like, this is the best thing ever. And I couldn't stop thinking about it. I mean, every time I'd go to Austin, I'm like, I want to go to Chipotle. Yeah. That's what you associated Austin with? Yes. <laughs> Which, you know, there's so many better Austin food places now. <laughs> but that's what I, I'm like, I want that. Right. And uh, so these group of the students in, in Lubbock sort of created create this page, and, and it worked to, to leverage this kind of grassroots campaign to get Chipotle to come open up in Lubbock. And my, my brother went, they opened uh, in 2012 and he stood in line for an hour and a half Good opening Lord. day. Like the line wrapped around the building twice Dang. just to get in. And uh, I'm like, okay. So I, I'm, I've seen the success of the, of these students. So I, I launched my own page bring Chipotle to Midland Odessa didn't have the numbers that Lubbock did, mm-hmm. but uh, Graco Real Estate, which is out of Lubbock, um, saw it. And they uh, used our page to pitch to Chipotle saying, hey, you've got about 900 people in Midland, Odessa who are looking to see you come. And this is a grassroots page that Chipotle didn't run. Graco Real Estate didn't run. And, they're like, and that's what s- sold them is – there's more and more of these kind of grassroots uh, pages and people who are just trying to advocate for things. Mm-hmm. And uh, so they open up and it's, you know, Graco says, well, this is why they chose. And I'm like, it worked. Yeah. 
And, and, uh, and then people started saying, oh, can you bring this place and this place and this place? I'm like, whoa, that's way too many pages. <laughs> right, okay. <laughs> so I, I was like, let me let me think about, like, let me be strategic here. What do I want more than anything else? <laughs> like, if I'm going to do this, I need to be invested in it. Because like, right. if it's a, a, a brand that I didn't really care about, why would I create a page for that? I don't yeah. want it. And uh, Yeah, go create your own page. Yeah, I'm like, <laughs> if you want it, you do it. Exactly. <laughs> and uh, so 2015, 2016 comes along, and um, all drops. Uh, late 2015, early 2016, I get laid off uh, from this old company. I remember calling my dad and said, hey, I got laid off today. He said, well, why don't you meet me for lunch? And so I have lunch with my dad. He said, well, why don't you come work for me? He'd been in insurance. I'm like, mm. Nobody ever, like, as a kid goes, I want to be an insurance person. <laughs> no. I grow up. And, uh, but I, I, so I said, okay, I'll I hear you out. And, and growing up, I, I mean, I never had a, a need that wasn't covered. We'd always go on good family vacations, had a, you know, nice things, you know, weren't crazy wealthy, but you know, good middle class. I'm like, that's a stable industry. Maybe I, I'll give it a, a shot. So um, he had his own agency, but he had sold it to a, a large, a larger agency um, in 2013. And uh, this larger agency, a lot of their clients or a lot of these brands. Mm -hmm. um, mm. And so as I'm learning the business and, and learning uh, a lot of who they work with and whatnot, I'm like, oh, I can go into Salesforce and find the contact information for some of these brands. So I, I was like, I need to find a way to leverage this now. Um, and so that kind of, as I was kind of trying to figure out where do we go from there, that was the idea was, well, instead of separate pages, Let's tell a better story for Midland. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we launched uh, maybe in Midland originally as it was known uh, in 2018. Okay. Um, April 1st, 2018. Oh. Yeah. It's a good day to trick people. <laughs> well, you know, it was the same, same day I got hired was April 1st, 2016. I always, <laughs> always joke that this is the biggest April Fool's joke my dad ever pulled on me <laughs> was to get me to come work for him. And... Uh, so I'm like, okay, I need to tell a better story of Midland because growing up here, we we didn't tell good stories. We yeah. were very self-deprecating. Uh, we yeah, we would just say, well, you know, it's Midland, it's West Texas. You know, and nobody's going to come out here. Why would I? I mean, why would want to be here in the first place? Mm -hmm. So I'm like, we got to change that. And and I was, you know, grow up growing up, I was in Boy Scouts, became an Eagle Scout, so always had that mentality of leave it better than you found it. So I'm like, well, as long as I'm here. What can I do to leave Midland better than I found it? Mm. And uh, so I started reaching out to some of these brands and just telling a story. I said, hey, let me make you think about why maybe in Midland should be your next location. Here's some of the economic data that came with it. Here's some of the people and the stories. And, and I wanted to leverage all these conversations into one spot. And so using kind of social conversations, economic data, good storytelling, get people to consider maybe in Midland. And, and then uh, who at the time I didn't know, but who's since become a friend, Craig Stoker, who was Mr. Odessa, kept bugging me like, well, why not Odessa too? Why not <laughs> Odessa too? So about six months down the road, we changed the name to maybe in Midland Odessa. And, uh, and said, well, you know what? You're, Craig, you're right. We, we need to be, we're better together. Mm -hmm. You know, there's always going to be that healthy rivalry, you know, as it's always been that way. Friday Night Lights is here. So there's always going to be some rivalry. But at the end of the day, we're West Texans. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, I remember, you know, when the, the shooting happened in Odessa, like that really showed why Midland Odessa is better together when we, you know, bring everybody together to, to solidify and, and rally around each other. Like mm -hmm. we're unstoppable. Mm -hmm. And uh, so as we've grown over time, you know, we've, we've specifically focused on restaurants, retail, entertainment, because the Economic Development Corporation, they're, they're not focused on, on those things. 
they're very supportive, mm. but that's not what they're chasing. Mm -hmm. You know, they're trying to diversify a little bit of the economy. So that's why you know, MDC was really big focus was you know on spaceport and aviation and trying to, to leverage what we have with Midland International Airport. And you know, DES has been really big with you know uh, logistics and distribution centers and uh, and playing off of that. But nobody was really focusing on these sectors, and so. Uh, as we've grown and we've continued to reach out to people, I, I now work for a different company uh, other than my dad. I, I um, now work for a company called Marsh McLennan Agency. We're the world's largest uh, insurance brokerage um, and the world's largest uh, company dedicated to uh, st strategy, risk, and people. Hmm. Um, you know, we're a Fortune 250 company, uh, $21 billion in annual revenue. And, and work with, you know, the Fortune 500s all the way down to startups. And again, a lot of these businesses are our clients. And so leveraging, you know, where I started and where I am now and st still making connections with those brands and just, again, being a better storyteller. Yeah. Are these brands now, I mean, I feel like they're proactively reaching out to you now, right? Like I felt like yeah. that's such notoriety that uh, I feel like you're, you're just getting the scoop on everybody. Well, it, and, and it's funny, you know, because a lot of the commercial real estate guys are like, they didn't know who I was for the longest time uh, until I did the TED Talk. And, uh, but yeah, now it's like when, when Bass Pro was announced earlier this year, uh, their team <laughs> reached out to me and said, hey, by the way, we've been following your page for two years. Mm. Oh, wow. I'm like, wait, what? <laughs> like, why didn't you reach out to you? Well, we, <laughs> we wanted to see what the what the conversations were going to make, to see if this was a good a good deal yeah. for us to come. And so, yeah, now it's like they are specifically reaching out saying, hey, you know, especially the, the developers, like, what brands can we go talk to on on your behalf? Who are mm -hmm. you talking to? Who can we partner together with to have conversations? Um, I mean, some are like, well, you're not a commercial realtor, so we can't pay you commission, but we'll we'll find however way to, you know, benefit you for just. I'm like, I, I'm not really in this for the money. Yeah, like I don't I don't monetize that page. I don't leverage. I was wondering, yeah, I was like, man, he's, I mean, I was like, if he's making money on this, I'm wondering how. Like, obviously, I've been marketing, right? So I'm right. sitting there going like, what is the, you know, I'm sitting there going like, what's the angle with this? You know, is he, yeah. is he a, um, is he a land broker? Like, is he, you know what I mean? It's like, <laughs> is he selling off the land to these places? I mean, it's super smart. But yeah, then I started, you know, then I, I, got, I got to know you and I was just like, hey, you're just trying to help Midland. I, Leave it better than you found it. Yeah. I, I guess. Like I'll say most Facebook groups, you are going to get uh, opinionated uh, comments what? from all different uh, angles. Mm -hmm. um, no. I mean, can you speak on just the overall? I feel like every time you, you, you announce something's coming in, you get, you, you get them all from, all from all sides. Yeah, yeah. So people find my page... Uh, very interesting that I will call people out um, because at the end of the day, I'm like, we'd, if, if you're not going to create any type of positive movement in making this better, your complaining without a solution is nothing more than whining. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't want whiners on my page. I'm okay with someone saying, hey, you know what? I have a difference of opinion on this. What about this? I will – I mean I'm all for that. I'm all for good feedback. Hey, I've. what about this? You know, I don't like this, but what about this? Okay, great. I, I will challenge people because a lot of them are like, well, can you bring this? I'm like, that's a franchise. Mm. And guess what? You live in Midland, Texas, the land of opportunity. Go do it yourself. Yeah. Like, that's really all it takes. And so I'll tell people, hey, if you want to bring this, guess what? You actually have an opportunity to do this. Don't. It's not the city's responsibility. It's not my responsibility. I'm going to have conversations to figure out, okay, if there is a franchiser who has the opportunity to expand, well, let me go talk to that franchise holder, mm -hmm. you know, and, and have bring them in. But the great thing is we've got people who are wanting to invest mm -hmm. into West Texas. I know it feels like every other announcement is either a coffee shop or a chicken joint. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, why don't they make a? Why don't they just combine that? Just like you know, two birds. Yeah, I mean, 
It's, are there any brands that um, you've either been in touch with or just heard, you know, throughout your connects that just would refuse to come here, refuse to, to start Midland or Odessa? Sorry. Yeah. Trader well, Trader Joe's, they're not necessarily against Midland Odessa. I love Trader Joe's. Oh, but I heard that they said they would never, ever come here. No, their focus is specifically on large metros right now. Okay. Um, and, and I think what, what hurts us a little bit, too, is we are on an island. Mm-hmm. We're, you know, I mean, we're drinking Tall City beer, and, you know, they're all, you know one of their key beers is five-hour drive. Yep. We are five hours from everybody. And so that that does create a little bit of uh, a difficulty, just the logistics of, of transporting things. And so when larger, especially the big box stores, I mean, Trader Joe's is a lot smaller than your typical – marketplace, but you still have to plan for how do we make this work in a way that um, we're making money mm-hmm. when we when we yeah. invest in here. That's the same with, you know, In-N-Out Burger. Um, I, I have a feeling that's going to start changing uh, in the future because it's they have been very much a stickler for you've got to be within a certain radius of their distribution center f- to maintain their quality standards. Mm, that makes sense. You know, it's like uh, Brahms Dairy, like – they won't come because we are just outside of that. Like Lubbock is about as far as they're going to go uh, for them to maintain their their freshness standards. And I appreciate businesses that are like, look, we're, we're trying to make, make sure you have a quality product. Yeah, it's not just no f- and there's no reason behind it. Like it's yeah. no, but here's why. Yeah. You know, and there are some that just we don't – we're not their market. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we, we're we not – we're not Dallas. We don't have the population. We sure. don't have so some of those more high end brands. We're just not going to have like a specific store. Now they may have a partner through a, another retailer where they can sell through, but some of those are, are, are going to be that. Um, I know Costco was was one that uh, is an interesting case study because they had announced that they were coming, and then COVID happened, and then. Uh, with everything that has happened since then, they have pulled back and changed their strategy. And mm-hmm. what they have said was they are no longer investing into communities where uh, the economy is driven by one singular industry. Interesting. Um, and uh, and so I don't know. Time to diversify then. Yes. I mean, if we could get the economy to be, I mean, 75% oil and gas, 25% other, <laughs> yeah, I think we would have a, a much more robust uh, economy. And I think we're shifting in that direction. Uh, I think what we have to do to get there is going to leverage the skill sets that are within oil and gas and find um, other industries where those transfer over well. So other manufacturing kind of blue collar r- related uh, industries fit that. But – then you have to be able to compete with the uh, pay mm-hmm. that oil and gas is, and that, and that's what I, I mean. That's what I do for a living at, at Marsh McLennan is, I I'm as an advisor uh, working with employers on total rewards. So how do we attract and retain talent uh, is a big part of those conversations. You know, we look at compensation studies, we look at their benefits program, we look at you know, employee engagement, leadership development, and then at the same time because they're trying to attract younger families from other places, mm-hmm. what's the quality of place look like? Mm-hmm. You know, uh, I'm so happy that we passed the school bond. Me too. Um, I mean, the schools need it because that that's the biggest concern was what's the state of education look like? Well, yes, we need to improve academically, but we have buildings that just have been unchanged. I mean, the last building that opened at Midland High opened when I was a senior, wasn't even open yet when I was there. Yeah, I mean, it was. <laughs> it started construction 20 years ago. Yeah. You know, we haven't done anything since then. And we've continued to grow. So I, I feel like that's going to help move that. Healthcare is another big issue. And, and we're starting to see more being invested in healthcare. Like you've got the new behavioral health center that's going to be built uh, in between both cities. And then beyond that, there are plans for a much larger medical campus. Um, to kind of focus on keeping uh, more people from having to travel outside mm-hmm. of West Texas to go have health care uh, taken care of for them. And uh, so you, some of those things, infrastructure, it feels like every street is under construction here. 
But you know, at the it's just it's just a culmination of, of four decades of, of kicking cans down the road, and it just we're getting it all done at once. And mm-hmm. yeah, it's painful and it's annoying. But once we get to the other side of this, yeah, it's I don't want to be, be so. Great. I never understand that argument because, granted, you know, I've only lived in a handful of cities um, in my life, but that's every city. Yeah. Like it's not unique to I think I think a lot of times people need to sort of put themselves, you know, they're in a vacuum, right? They're in an echo chamber and going like this is that's every city, right? Like Look, I'm they're literally on. building a racetrack on the, <laughs> the on the Las Vegas strip right now. Like you <laughs> yeah. don't think that's annoying for the people who oh, work I, there and things like that, but it's like somebody I, was saying it was gonna take them five hours to get to work on the strip. That's probably right. I could imagine. I mean, I'm a Formula One fan, and as as excited as I am about the race that's going to take place on the Strip, I couldn't imagine like living there, working there, like or even visiting there because people I've I've seen the videos, people like posting where the the grandstands are, like he's blocking the views of why you come to Vegas, and I'm yeah. like, that's Vegas though. That's yeah. the thing, right? Like it's it's um. Over the top for the sake of being over the top, right? But mm-hmm. for, but living in Vegas my entire life, and again, this is like, you know, I didn't, this wasn't me going like, oh, I'm. Com- this is a bunch of comparisons, right? Like, I came from the city that anything of substance, any building of substance that was 25 years old or, or would just be demolished, yeah. right? It was constantly like, yeah, that's old, get rid of it. And old because it's just not entertaining anymore, mm-hmm. right? And so I was kind of, used to that but also it would just makes it would make so the city just kept expanding and expanding further and further out um to allow for other industries outside of you know uh, tourism and 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 casinos and gambling and things like that but i was going to ask like in terms of the from the entertainment side right like again being here now three years and tara you know growing up here i would hear this constant, like, there's nothing to do here. Um, and same thing, right? Like, maybe I'm in a different stage of my life now, but I was, and, you know, uh, versus, like, I'm not, you know, I'm not looking for 22-year-old party life or something like that. Versus, but I go, this is this is not a uh, Midland, you know, conversation. This is, if you're from a, quote-unquote, smaller town, smaller city, there's only so many things, but I don't. But at the same time, like when I see you mention things like, oh, "Hey, this is coming," or "This is coming," people are like, "Yeah, but that's not for me." So, so I don't care. Yeah. But I want what I want. You know what I mean? Like, how do how do you balance that? Really? You, you, I mean, well, it's like with the bond. There's no such thing as a perfect bond. You can't get consensus with 180,000 people. You, you're never gonna get it. And uh, with people who are like, "Well, what what about entertainment options?" You know. They're going to be small niches of people. Like there's one guy's like, I really want like a, a rock concert venue, like heavy metal rock. I'm like, I, I just don't see that unless you create that. Yeah, I'd be like, oh, hey, you should build one. Like, s- same same sort of aspect, right? Like we hear like, and am- they need to build an amusement park here, and I would go like. <laughs> Locals don't go to their city's amusement park. No. That's for tourists. No, and tourists and, in West Texas. <laughs> okay, like, are people going to come from Dallas and Austin and Houston to Midland for an uh, amusement park? I no. mean, I, I, who's I, coming I, to this? Yeah, thing? Like I tell people all the time, like when that that conversation come up. So, Joyland in Lubbock, which was uh, a Lubbock staple for sixty years, is nothing more than a glorified carnival that had a big roller coaster. You know, they shut down this year because they just couldn't afford to operate anymore. I'm like, think about that. Lubbock and the metro area is about the same size as Midland Odessa. They can't support their own. Mm-hmm. And, and Lubbock they, is a college town. It is a college town. Right. And that seemed, that even idea of that facility sounds like a teenage to just kind of getting out of college type of age range. Right. right. And the fact of the matter is that. Teenagers and college kids today have a lot more options than to go ride roller coasters yeah. in, than in the 80s and the 90s and the early yeah. 2000s, perhaps. And, and so I'm like, unless you just want a glorified mall parking lot carnival, 
we're, we're not going to get that. Mm-hmm. And the cost alone for someone to go, I want to invest to do that. Like you have not just the infrastructure cost, but the risk in behind it. And that's what I tell people all the time because like that's where my job intersects is I've got colleagues that, that there are business insurance, business risk advisors. And so they're consulting on the risks that mm. businesses have. You know, we talk about like, you know, Greenwood or West Odessa. Why can't they get a grocery store? Well, once you leave the city limits, the the commercial insurance costs skyrocket because you are further away from infrastructure. You are further away from public services like mm. fire and police and and uh, emergency services, so those costs go up. Interesting. Okay. And so it's like, and unless you incorporate, you probably won't see those things happen. That's why Dollar General pops up all over the place. You know, <laughs> they're very strategic <laughs> in their uh, in their commercial real estate deals. I'm sure. So, outside of you, and I don't know that you, I, I would say that you spend a lot. Of, I mean, you can obviously um, correct me on this, but. I don't know that you probably have the bandwidth to spend a lot of time to educate around those types of things. Cause I would have never, I would have never have known those things. Like, well, why aren't more people talking about the reasons why not? I think a lot of it just, it, it is an education component. They yeah. just, they don't know. I mean, we don't know what we don't know. Sure. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and so I have taken the time to kind of educate people a little bit more with certain things. Like there was that real viral post about uh, some girl on Facebook. I wish, you know, the city of Midland would do this with in- entertainment. I'm like, let's let's pull back that, you know, that viral post. And that <laughs> and we talked about like, here's why these things. And we talked about the entertainment aspect. We talked about the cost involved with water parks and amusement parks and zoos. And and we can talk about the zoo in a minute because I've got to, to know, know a little bit about that and got to work with those guys. And, and, uh, and it's an exciting project. But just trying to educate people on here's here's the reality. You know, I talked the other day with a post about uh, how we have underfunded ourselves from a tax perspective uh, for 40 years. And, and that has hurt a little bit of the quality of place. Mm-hmm. And so, so I, I showed the historical data. So for Midland, over the last five years, our city tax uh, on the property, so not, not county, not... MISD, no, I didn't look at that. I just looked at the city tax. We have decreased the tax rate nine and a half percent over the last five years. But our property values have gone up 54%. Mm-hmm. And so if we took those same numbers, the today's current taxable value compared to the tax rate from five years ago, we would have seven and a half million dollars more wow. in tax money for whatever, whether that's let's hire more police, fire, invest in our parks, wh- whatever that may be, we would have that money there. And like, we've prided ourselves for so long that we've had the lowest tax rate. You know, our, our comparable um, city peers are almost double sometimes those those numbers. I mean, if, if not double, they're at least 50% higher. And, and there's a reason why those cities – have the services they have because they have more income coming in. We we have put ourselves in a position where we rely way more on sales tax than the actual property tax to fund mm-hmm. uh, city services. And, and that's a dangerous place to put ourselves in. And I don't like paying taxes just like anybody else. <laughs> but if, if I know that what we're doing is to in, invest in our community better and, and, I don't know why we don't talk about it like that because Midland is home to many brilliant business people. Mm -hmm. Why don't we talk about the city as a business? Well, it's because this is the home of George W. Bush and George H. W. Bush and in a very ultra conservative mindset. Mm -hmm. And and those values aren't bad. Sure. But we've kind of pigeonholed ourselves that this is like there's no way out. Yeah. Didn't this people of Midland like vote down a lot of smaller bonds over the years? Yeah. And so this is kind of like, all right, well now you get to spend big now, money. Now we're spending the big money because we've yeah. we've waited too long. Yeah. And uh, it's like, look, the issue is not the tax rate. The issue is is skyrocketing property values, mm-hmm. uh, and that's every city in Texas is. I mean, 
you know, property values have gone up. Yeah. And so we've overvalued ourselves on the property side and undervalued ourselves on the tax side. So how do we get out of that? Uh, because like, I love having a property show my property value up every year. Cause my, yeah, that's my, my equity and my, my net worth is going up. <laughs> so property value looks great when I'm ready to sell, but man, I hate seeing that tax appraisal letter come in every year. So oh, you're going to have to pay this much more, even though taxes have either been a, a net, uh, zero increase, but it still goes up. <laughs> yeah. Like, you get, you take the good with the bad and, uh, but uh, I mean, some comments, you know, people are like, yeah, we have a house in, in Denton that's half the square footage of our home in Midland. It's same, you know, amount of taxes there. I'm like, yeah, but think about the things that you get. Mm-hmm. I mean, here's what I hear. You have two homes, so. <laughs> you can afford it. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, Money bags. Yeah, that's a, uh, what a terrible <laughs> problem you have. Um, okay, so speaking of things to do in Midland, you just mentioned the zoo. So, yeah, tell us more yeah. about the zoo. So, Zoo Midland, um, you know, that that kind of caught me off guard. I knew that uh, the people behind it had been working on it for a while. So, it's the same people uh, and investors who helped rehabilitate and bring back Green Acres. Nice. Um, and, and they were at the time buying up land around Green Acres for kind of a, a – petting zoo plus type uh, atmosphere. But then when uh, the new wave of Vista land um, came available, um, they didn't need all the acreage. And so um, they had met with the guys who were doing the preserve project and said, Hey, what if we partner together and, and, and um, do this? And so zoo Midland, uh, it is the first ground up zoo built in America in 25 years. Wow. Um, it's 51 acres. So to put that into perspective, uh, at full build out, it'll be the fifth largest zoo in Texas. Wow. Uh, okay. Wow. Um, so like the Dallas Zoo, which is the largest zoo in Texas, is 104 acres. Uh, the Houston Zoo is 55 acres. So, oh, wow. Um, so lots of uh, opportunity. Um, they, they brought in a, a really cool guy by the name of Jason Green, who is going to be overseeing all of the zoological components. Uh, he comes from Zoo Tampa, which has uh, consistently been a top five zoo in America, uh, according to USA Today. He's also got experience at uh, Bush Gardens, so he, he knows his stuff. And uh, so they're going to be developing, um, at first, about half the, the total acreage because uh, they want to be able to build out over years and not to do it all at once mm -hmm. um, because then – Where's the fun in that? It's like well, you, you get it all done and be like, well, we've seen it all. Like, no, yeah. there's, there's there's things to do. So they'll have uh, several different distinct um, sections, but it's going to be very interactive uh, in a way that, that uh, Jason likes to talk about it being like we're bringing the back of the zoo to the front. So okay. that way, you know, people of all ages and abilities will be able to be right there next to the animals as close as safe and safely as they mm -hmm. can. Um, I know a lot of the people who have questioned uh, or with the neighborhood around it, like at, at minimum, they'll be 300 feet from the closest fence, uh, which will be an eight foot fence that goes around the property. At, but in reality, it, it's, you know, it'll be about 500 feet um, from the nearest animal enclosure um, to, to the families. And they're going to uh, build a lot of greenscape around that to, to help with some of that. And people ask like, what about the smell? I'm like, well, you're more likely to We're smell your, yeah. So you're what are you like, talking about? The smells in West Texas, animals are the least of my concerns. I mean, you're more likely to smell your neighbor who hasn't picked up after their dog in four days yeah. than you are the animals at the zoo where they're picking up daily. So yeah. I'm smelling, I'm smelling oil. Sulfur. Sulfur. Yeah. yeah that's, I mean, that's, I'm, I'm not worried about a lion habitat. I mean, I think it would be so cool to have my back fence 500 yards from, like, the elephant's back fence. Yeah, it'd be fantastic. Yeah. Oh, I mean, be in heaven. And there's some people, like, how cool is that, you know, for their kids to be able to walk in the backyard? And you can see, now, at, at the distance, you probably won't see yeah. maybe some giraffe's heads sticking <laughs> up over the fence. But to be that close, it's mm -hmm. not going to be like Disney's Animal Kingdom where you walk out onto your balcony and there's an elephant oh, you know, right there. That. It would be really cool. Now, yeah. I will say this. They, they are building 
uh, some e- event space for peop- for corporate events or weddings or parties that will be right there overlooking the giraffe uh, enclosure. Yeah, um, nice. So you know, if you want to get married at the zoo, they're yeah, going to have that thinking. that option, and then have your reception right there uh, over it. So they'll have a section that that focuses on uh, savanna, which I mean, I think a lot of people don't realize a lot of that s- savanna uh, climate is very similar to West Texas. So they are trying to focus on animals that fit our climate. You know, you're not going to see polar bears in West Texas, <laughs> unfortunately. Maybe in February, but that's um, it. <laughs> yeah, if the grid, you know, lets us if down. We shut down again, yeah. Um, so no no polar bears. And and then they'll, they'll have that uh, farm animal petting zoo component that they originally talked about. And uh, they'll have kind of this treetops, you know, animals, jaguars, like kind of, kind of semi-rainforest-ish uh, and then a, an aquatic section that phase two will include an aquarium with like stingrays and shark tank uh, sh- and, and touch tanks and things like that. They'll have a, a bug zoo. So all the different insects and creepy ca- crawlers and what, whatnot. <laughs> um, and uh, and while it's going to take them a while to to build out because it's going to take – I mean they're, they're building 40-plus structures. Yeah. It's going to take two and a half, three years for them to build out uh, – but they're investing $115 million Dang. into the zoo. Um, and they're not asking the city for money. It's all privately funded, and which is which is great. Yeah. Uh, for, and it's like everybody's like, well, we don't need a zoo. I'm like, well, you're not the one spending the money on it. So you're going to complain about it, but we'll see you on opening day. Right. You know? Oh, 100% <laughs> would be there. I mean, this is – I love that it's uh, privately funded because, yeah, there there is real – there's no real argument that we don't need a zoo. Says who? We don't need a zoo. You know what yeah. I mean? The like eighty year old who's never gonna go. It provides jobs, that's for sure. Yeah, they're gonna have um, like 300, 300 positions. And people are like, Well, how are you gonna fill it? Well, in talking with Jason said, because this is the first zoo in twenty five years, there's not a lot of mobility uh, upwards for growth in the zoo world. Mm-hmm. He's getting resumes from people from all over the country when it wow. comes work here. I'm sure. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's new. Is there and, time to like step up their Yeah, work? Times have probably changed. Right. And yeah. Again, I, I, I kind of look at it from that perspective. Like I've been to, you know, the San Diego zoo and, and it's been many years. Right. But I mean, again, when you're talking about like even parents that are like, there's not enough things to do. I mean, this is a, this is a family play. This is to make Midland more family friendly yeah. to where people are relocating, you know, perhaps for, you know, into the oil business or industry and the things, the other types of industries you're talking about, right? Dining, entertainment, all of those things help support. Those are for yeah. families coming in that are like, okay, well, we live here now, right? Uh, we need to, we we want to go out and eat. We want we shopping is a big thing, obviously, and things to do with our kids and things like that. And so I think the zoo, I think that's a it makes perfect sense. Yeah, it's a brilliant idea. Yeah. yeah, it's I mean, and and what they're doing with in conjunction, I mean. Well, it's a separate project, but being right next to the preserve, like what those guys are doing to create more green space, to create an environment that, I mean, you know, the, the, everybody commented about, well, where are you going to find the water? Because the, the, the lake feature, it was the first thing that people like, well, there's the water in Texas. Like, yeah. well, here's where you're finally going to go fishing for the Bass Pro Shop down the street. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, but like that's an actual playa lake area. That they're going to actually develop, they're doing a, a a true flood study to minimize the impact of flooding in the neighborhood. Because the, when they built the golf course there, they didn't really do that. Yeah, uh, and it created issues where, like, mm. we had you know a couple of years ago a twenty five year flood uh, where the water was not coming into houses, but it was coming up to the the right up to the foot of the house. Wow, and uh, so they're are really going to, to make sure that that minimizes that impact and then, and it flows into the draw behind it uh, and, and, Smart. and and allows that. So they'll have a boardwalk component very much like there's a place in Abilene called Allen uh, Ridge uh, right by Abilene Christian University that, that has built this really great little kind of pond and boardwalk with restaurants and shops. And so they're kind of mimicking some of, some of that, but then they will be, you know, they've got 123 acres, but, Really, eighty of that will be for development. The rest of it's green space, uh, two and a half miles of of trails and, and whatnot. They're talking with um, 
some other uh, nonprofits about doing like the uh, Energy City um, half marathon, like doing some stuff that where you're running through that area. Nice. And um, and so the uh, their focus is really creating a, a local appeal of restaurants and retail, some office, um, but no residential, you know, because they're not changing the zoning. Mm-hmm. Uh, so like the, the tallest building, uh, I think can only be like 30 feet. Oh, nice. Uh, so that way, if you know people who live around it, like you're not going to have a 10 story building looking out over all of that. Like it's only allowed to like two floors or, you know, and, uh, so you're know, really just kind of making it, you know, spend the day at the zoo and then come have dinner on the boardwalk. Yeah. You know, there'll be green space with you know, just like the the park next door where they'll have events and things going on. And just you can spend the whole day with your family in this area. And not yeah. even feel like you're in West Texas. And not, exactly. Yeah. Not feel like you're in West Texas. And so these two projects combined, when, when that's fully built out, will be about a half billion dollar worth of real estate. Where currently as a golf course, uh, it wasn't worth you know, more than two. Wow. It's a big jump. Big jump. And again, those guys, they're not asking for city money. They're not asking for the city to, to like, no, we're, we're doing this as investors. Yeah. What's the overall, what's the overall tone or, or consensus on the Bass Pro Shops? I think there's a, a lot of people were, were kind of questioning, like, why Midland of all places? Well, the tracker boat store off of Loop 250 is owned by Bass Pro Shops. Mm. That has been one of the top selling locations in the entire country for Bass Pro for over three decades. They know you're already leaving Midland to go. Yeah. You know we, I mean? I mean, you're going to tell your boat. Yeah, my family used to have a lake house at, at Possum Kingdom three and a half hours oh, nice. away. And we'd go every other weekend. Yeah. Like, there are people, I mean, you go down to uh, Horseshoe Bay outside of Austin. Half the people that live there are from Midland. Yeah. I mean, you name half a dozen lakes within two or three hours of here, and half the people on that lake are from Midland. There's a, by the way, there's a Bass Pro Shop off the Strip in Las Vegas. So the same people talk about where's the water. and the, Yeah, there's Lake Mead, but it's not great. There's That's better now. Uh, hundreds of lakes Yeah. Um, better in, here in Texas. But the same people I laugh because they'll say, where's the water or what? And then they'll they'll go into Vegas and walk right by the Bellagio Fountain, and go. This makes sense. Yeah. Right. Yeah. In the middle of yeah. the desert. Yeah. It, <laughs> you know, and it it's one of those things that I'm like, look, one, tell me you've never been in a Bass Pro without telling me you've never been in a Bass Pro. Like they sell so many different things. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, when I was on my big road trip recently, I, I stopped at the biggest Bass Pro in the country, which is in Memphis. It's inside the pyramid, uh, which is an old arena that that Johnny Morris bought um, and converted into a Bass Pro. And there's a hotel and a restaurant on the 28th floor of the pyramid, and uh, and walking around like ATVs and outdoors. I mean, a whole bunch of out hunting and, stuff, like they, everything. Yeah, there's so much more out there. Yeah. Now that one was really cool because like the boat section, they literally had boats in water like you were walking up on a dock. Yeah, I'm like, that's cool. Um. But they, you know, Johnny Morris and uh, is friends with several old guys out here. It's these old guys who said, hey, why don't you build here? I mean, Lubbock has a Cabela's, which Bass Pro and Cabela's have merged. And, uh, and so that's what everybody thought was we were going to get one of those, you know, Cabela's outpost. So the Cabela's in Lubbock is 42,000 square feet. And originally when they announced that they were going to come to Midland, uh, it was a 50,000-square-foot store. Then it got upgraded to a 65,000-square-foot store. Dang. And then because of the uh, immediate positive response to Bass Pro coming, they upgraded to a 100,000-square-foot full outdoor world. Dang. That's what there is in Vegas, an outdoor world. I remember going to that. And, I, and at that time, With like the big never hunted time? or yeah. fished. Yeah. And I'd go in there. And it's, now you're an avid Because there's cool stuff. There's cool stuff. Yeah. I mean, I, I stopped at two. I stopped at one in Shreveport and the one in Memphis. And, like, there's cool stuff in here. And so now you've got 100,000 square foot Bass Pro. And I hear jobs. Yeah. It's going to be 100 plus jobs. Uh, Bass Pro pays really well. I mean, they take care of their people really well. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and 
like you've got this huge entertainment space that's being built around it now. Right. Like in front of it, there'll be some some pad sites for national branded restaurants, uh, along with right there at that corner of 158, 191, there'll be some smaller, you know, quick service restaurant types uh, of places. But then now you have the zoo and the preserve a mile, less than a mile away, right across the street uh, of 191, uh, Sewell is building a new dealership that's going to be kind of more high-end brands. Mm. So BMW, Buick, uh, Cattle. Can I finally get my Bentley? GMC. I wish. I wish. <laughs> um, Cut that. Cut that out of the episode. <laughs> I mean, I'm sorry. Where am I going to get my cyber truck? I don't even want that. Yeah, that's that's better. Um, let Wait, me ask I you. Have a, please, I, please, please. Yeah. What I hear when they say Bass Pro Shop is coming is shopping for my dad for his birthday and Christmas just got a whole lot easier. Some and my the, brother and like. The number of women co- who commented, our husbands are ne- we're never going to be able to get them out of the store. Cool. I'm like. <laughs> it's, You're it, welcome. It, yeah, I'm like, <laughs> well, would you them rather spend all their time in Bass Pro or at the bar? Let's say five, ten years out, like our, what you don't have to say brands per se, but like what types of businesses could you see that have never been here before, things like that? And, and, and on the flip side, like ones that you're like, probably never going to happen. I think one that you'll see, so Trader Joe's cousin is Aldi. So mm-hmm. Trader Joe's is in Aldi are both owned by a com- company that is owned by two brothers in Germany known as Aldi North and Aldi South. Uh, Aldi South owns Trader Joe's. Aldi North owns Aldi USA. Are they related to Kanye West? They're not. <laughs> uh, and uh, Aldi, which has very much similar style to Trader Joe's, just without the you know major emphasis on the Whole Foods like mm-hmm. mentality. It's they're they're much very much a white label, our own brand to keep costing on. Aldi, I think, will come this way. So I think you'll see that because I think from a grocery pr- perspective, we do need more grocery stores. Mm-hmm. Um, and Walmart's looking into the northwest side of, of Midland. I think once the loop is f- officially complete, mm. that will really grow that side of town mm-hmm. um, because that area is the fastest growing area in Midland. But it just the infrastructure is not in place yet. Uh, we don't have enough north-south roads, so when Fairgrounds gets to expand, that will help. Uh, I think when Todd Road goes north, that will help, and then have that overpass there to complete the loop around the north side. Mm-hmm. That will really drive commercial development in that area where you see some more grocery stores. Um, I think from an entertainment perspective, the zoo is going to be the biggest thing that ha- that has happened, uh, yeah, but... I think you'll see a lot more family-friendly development take place Mm -hmm. because now people have a reason to stay and want to stay instead of going someplace else on the weekend. I think you'll see more restaurants um, pop up that that are new to market. Yeah, there are probably going to be some more chicken places that come this way. Uh, I know that Bojangles, uh, which is a a southeast U.S. place, they are looking – out mm. here. And I will say their biscuits beat Popeyes every day. Yeah. Um, so you'll see some of those things, but I think you'll see a little bit more diversity because we've made the investments into education and healthcare. Yeah. That will bring in new opportunities. I know, um, you know, the spaceport hasn't really developed the way that we've hoped it has. And so I'm hoping that we really put some, some more investment behind aerospace as a whole mm-hmm. in that area where we do have some more things because the airport really is a major asset to the area. Absolutely. Um, and so I, I want to see more geared in that direction. And there, and there is a need for, you know, more aviation maintenance technicians. Uh, so you know, Midland college has a aviation maintenance program. I want to see that grow and, and, and be leveraged where we're training people to actually stay here. Yeah. I would love to see more on the space side. You know, Blue Origin uh, launch site is, you know, three hours away in Van Horn. Well, why can't we leverage the fact that we we have a spaceport here? Mm-hmm. You know, we've got AST that's making satellites. 
you know, I wish X Corps would have worked out, you know, in, in that regard of, of being able to launch spacecraft from here. You've got Red Hawk Aerospace. Like, there, there's more happening. Mm -hmm. And so I want to see that grow more. And I want to see downtown actually be a, a legitimate downtown. I think you know, I was talking to a, a colleague. He's like, I just, I've never seen Midland being a downtown city. And uh, everybody who's like, we don't need to, to invest money downtown. I said, why is that? I'm curious about that part. We're downtown right now. So yeah, I think a lot of it is just the, the mindset has been, if we invest into bringing people downtown, we're going to turn it into sixth street, which yeah. is not our culture at all. I would, I yeah. would love to have seen. It's not, it's also not a massive college town. Yeah. No. What I That's why 6th Street is 6th Street. Yeah. What I would love downtown Midland to kind of maybe emulate is uh, Fort Worth. Because downtown Fort Worth, that that has a very much a vibe mm -hmm. that fits the culture of West Texas. It's very family friendly. Um, there, is, there are places to eat, shop. You know, for those who who want a bar, there 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 are those there. Mm -hmm. There is nightlife, and then there is downtown living. Now, yeah, that's the downtown living part is really the, the major missing component. Yes, we have the Wall Street lofts, but we don't have the infrastructure to support downtown. There's not a downtown grocery. Right. Yeah, I think they like opening like a little bodega down here would be the cutest thing. I mean, even if if CVS opened up a store in the old Midland National Bank building, mm -hmm. like that's all you need. Yeah. You don't, I mean, things that will take care of your basic groceries, right. you know. Like a little bit of sugar, a little bit of hour. milk. Yeah. <laughs> no, not 24 hour. Let's bring Vegas here. Okay. <laughs> Speaking about that, though, like compare Midland downtown and Odessa downtown. Because I haven't spent as much time at downtown Odessa. But things like First Friday, um, yeah. I think it's very um, so attractive. Downtown, downtown Odessa has a – one, they have people with vision for downtown Odessa. And they still have a little bit of that downtown um, Main Street vibe. It feels very walkable. Yeah. We we don't have that. We when we started building office towers, we got rid of down or of of street level retail. Mm -hmm. And that's what I think has killed downtown, is we did not plan that well. Because every other major downtown, they kept street level retail. We we didn't. Mm -hmm. Downtown Odessa has it. They don't have the tall buildings like we do, but they have the street level retail, and they have people who have chosen to invest into downtown. And, and then you have people with um, like Randy Ham at Odessa Arts who said, "Hey, let's do First Fridays to, and create a cultural event with different places um, doing different things and just getting people to come downtown." Mm -hmm. uh, I know. I love it. I love that. It, I mean, it, and it's such a they've done such a great job with it. And getting people involved in the other businesses. Hey, we want to participate. We want to do something to, to contribute. Uh, and so there's something for everybody. Yeah. You know, like it's not just like one thing and it's not all art driven either, which mm -hmm. is the other big thing. Uh, I know um, Stacey Livingston with Midland AF is, is trying to do that with the Midland Art Crawl. Mm -hmm. If if she had a downtown like Odessa to do that with, it would, it would yeah. be amazing. Mm -hmm. It would be an actual... Crawl. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> not a drive. Not a drive. Um, and so I think as we start developing things like, you know, we've got the uh, Midland Tapestry Hotel going mm -hmm. in. You've got the Double Tree, which is asking for a lot of money for redevelopment. I wish they would kick in more of their own money mm -hmm. than asking with the city. And then the Hotel Santa Rita and what, what like, once those get done, they'll be, they'll be big for downtown. Yeah. But the health of any city's downtown, its economic viability has a direct correlation to the overall metro eco economy. Mm. Uh, so the more that we invest downtown, the more you'll see the economy grow outside of downtown. I feel like growing up that Odessa was like, you know, Midland and Odessa are sister cities. So like Odessa was like the black sheep of the family and Midland was like, the one in the popular club. <laughs> but now, like, Odessa is, like, the artsy, funky, younger sister that's not the black sheep anymore. Yeah. I like it. Yeah. I mean, it, it – and I think a lot of that is just the vision of people that have been there for a while and said, hey, we want 
we want to do something different. Yep. And and they're doing it where Midland is very much like we've got to get past this buttoned up white collar. Very sm- corporate. Corporate. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I I was sitting a couple weeks ago in a class and, and Bobby Burns, who was mayor uh, while I was growing up and. Uh, now leads the uh, Chamber of Commerce, at least through the end of this year before he retires, made a comment about um, what he wished would have happened. So his his two big projects with me was the sports complex and the airport. Um, and uh, and I told Bobby, I said, I really appreciate the airport because when it opened in 1999, it opened on my birthday, and that's where we went for my birthday is we went to the airport um, <laughs> to celebrate. And But he goes, I wish we would have built – the baseball stadium downtown. I wish we would have built the baseball stadium and the football stadium both together yeah. downtown. And so that was that was what I wanted. But I knew that if I fought too hard for it, I wouldn't get it at all. Mm-hmm. Um, so he said, I, I didn't fight that. But going to cities where they have built stadiums downtown in the last 10 years or really 20 years, um, Oklahoma City, um, Houston, Las Vegas. Las Vegas. Um, what stadiums there? You know, like they have built up so much new things around. They have revitalized. Mm-hmm. Like Oklahoma City, my, my youngest brother used to live there for a number of years, and I used to go up there quite a bit. That was an old industrial warehouse district that they have turned into – the entertainment district. You've that sounds cool in itself. I've never even been there. I want to go to Oklahoma <clears throat> City so bad. I was pushing for us to move there. Do you remember that? I do. So it's not now known as Bricktown. And yeah. so it's got its own little river walk, just like um, San Antonio. But that baseball stadium, and then you've got a movie theater, and then all these old warehouse buildings have been converted into restaurants and retail and residential units. Like, it is the place to be. Yeah. It's really, really cool. I mean, even uh, Amarillo with the Hodgetown Ballpark. Like, I'm like, I used to go up to Amarillo on a monthly basis um, to work with some clients, and I would be excited to get there during the summer and become like, I'm going to go to the baseball game. I mean, I, I love our Rock Hounds because, mm-hmm. I, I mean, I love going to sporting events, and, and the Rock Hounds are never going to be the world champion Texas Rangers. <laughs> <laughs> we can say that. Never say yes. never. Never say never. I mean, well, I mean, and, and I would say the Rock Hounds have won there, the Texas League number number of times. It's, it's still fun to go, but yeah. there's not going to be Major League Baseball. And uh, But I, I've gone to games to watch the Sod Poodles. I don't care who they're playing. I'm just, yeah. I just want to go. And that, I mean, to walk across the street from the hotel to the baseball stadium and then walk to dinner or drinks afterwards, like, it's all right there. Yeah. Well, you can do that at our stadium now. That's Seattle, too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We lived in Seattle for a few years. Okay, so I don't want to – I uh, I do want to talk about your documentary. So tell us tell us about – you're, I mean, filmmaker now. Let's yeah, filmmaker. Tell us. Out of all the things going from, you know, being an author, speaker, consultant, podcast host times two – um, to, to now a documentary uh, filmmaker. So, um, you know, recently got divorced and just trying to find a way to process that. Um, and my therapist goes, oh, you should, you should journal. I'm like, I already hate writing to begin with. Like the one, the, the author stuff that I do, I'm like, I've leveraged a lot of AI to write a lot of the things that I've, I've published, but I'm like, I don't want to do that. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> I just... I'll write it and I'll never, it's it just, it's not the creative out, outlet that I needed. And so I'm like, I mean, what am I going to do? And I thought back to the first thing that I, she ever told me, the first time I'm, I visited with her, she goes, go do something for you. Uh, and this is about a year and a half ago because um, my my ex-wife had a lot of mental health issues and, and, and needed help and she's getting the help that she's uh, needs now still. And... Uh, so I'm like, what am I going to do? Well, I was going to Fort Worth, and I'm like, well, I always love going to um, Founders Plaza, which is the viewing park at DFW Airport. I'm just going to sit and watch airplanes. And so I I went and I sat and I watched airplanes for two hours just by myself, complete silence. And it was very therapeutic. Just it got me out of kind of my funk uh, and, and the emotions I was feeling at that time. And, and I'm like, okay, this is kind of healing just to do something for me because I had put mm-hmm. myself on hold 
for two years, uh, just constantly trying to, to be a caretaker. Yeah. And uh, and so when I told my boss that I was getting divorced, he goes, well, you know, he had been kind of in that similar situation. He's like, well, you know, I would much rather you go take a week or two off just to clear your head. I'm like, okay. If I took a week off, what do I want to do with that? And I, I've always, going back to my aviation background, I've always wanted to go to Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. That's where the Wright Brothers' first flight was. Never been, but it had been on my bucket list forever. And I'm like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to drive. I'm going to do a road trip. And I'm like, I'm going to film it. I'm going <laughs> to film this trip and use it as a video journal of not just the trip, but just me kind of talking through what I experienced with going through divorce. And so I'm like, okay, I'm going to do this trip. It's not going to be a chronological documentary of just I stopped here, here, and here. But for me, it was I'm going to Kitty Hawk to get to get back to being me, to, to get back a piece that I had kind of lost. Mm-hmm. And so uh, out of that came the idea for Write Me a Love Story. It is a love letter to myself. Um, and uh, so nine days, 3,600 miles, eight states, five different filming locations. Um, and uh, so we, we filmed all of that. I uh, literally got back a week ago from, from filming. And I remember getting to, uh, to Kitty Hawk and my boss asked me, what was it like? I said, you know, funny enough, the Outer Banks of North Carolina are a lot like West Texas. <laughs> Sand everywhere, uh, vegetation that shouldn't be there, but is there. The only difference is the Atlantic Ocean's on one side. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and I said, and the wind, I thought West Texas was windy. It was like nonstop wind for like, like 20 miles an hour constantly. Wow. And I, I get to uh, the Wright Brothers Memorial um, on Wednesday, November 1st. And I, I specifically wanted to be there on that day because that was my wedding anniversary. Mm. Um, I wanted to reclaim that day for myself. And so I get there and I'm like, okay, this is, this is, it was an emotional day, you know, cause there, there were those mixed emotions. I was excited to be there, but then I was like, it was also kind of sad yeah. because a year ago I was on another beach in the Bahamas celebrating my anniversary mm-hmm. and this time I'm not. And so that morning before I went, I, I wrote myself a letter and then went. Um, and then I also wrote a letter to my ex-wife. Um, that that evening I read standing facing the ocean, just kind of a I, I let you go type moment. Are you going to make me cry? You're going to make me cry. <laughs> Bring it up. But I, I, I needed that. I needed a release. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I needed to say it's OK to walk away. Yeah. Um, and uh, so we filmed film there. And, and I filmed some other places, too. Like um, the first stop I, I made was Tuskegee National Park. Okay. Uh, so we I – mean, because I was driving through Alabama. Like I want to stop at – you know, here's where the Tuskegee Airmen um, trained. And uh, and so that was, that was neat to see that piece of history. Even getting through there, I could drive through Selma, Alabama. So I got to drive across wow. the bridge. Oh, wow. Um, and I, I texted a friend of mine, uh, Adrian Allen, who um, – he went to a uh, historical black college and um, worked on President Obama's campaign staff. And I, I texted him and I just said, hey, I just crossed the bridge and and I know how much this means to you. Like, I just wanted to let you know that that I wanted you to know that I just kind of came across this. And, and it was very moving to just drive across and think about the history that yeah. took place there. Same, same at Tuskegee and to think through like what – those men in Tuskegee went through and the men and women who went through the civil rights, you know, mm-hmm. stuff went through and just like, and, and, uh, and see that, you know, firsthand. Um, and, and then filmed at the Museum of Aviation at Robbins Air Force Base in Georgia, which is the second largest Air Force Museum uh, in the country. The Air Force Museum in, in Dayton, Ohio is the largest. And uh, so filmed there and, and then drove up to... Um, South Carolina and then up to, to North Carolina the next day and, you know, get to Kitty Hawk and we film. And I just remember thinking, like, with that wind, it was cold <laughs> and going, these guys did this in December. 
it's a good thing that I wasn't the Wright brothers because I would have picked to do this in <laughs> July. Yeah, <laughs> like it, and to to see it and just you know walk uh, the distance. So the the very first flight is 120 feet. It's 12 seconds. It doesn't seem very big when you. I mean, there are airplanes that fly today that are twice the length of that mm-hmm. first flight. Sure. Um, and uh, and then to walk to the top of the monument. So the, the monument itself sits on top of the hill. Uh, so everybody calls Kitty Hawk the, the birthplace of aviation. Kitty Hawk was the closest town. It's Kill Devil Hills um, is really where it took place. And Kill Devil Hill still exists. And it's a 90-foot tall sand dune. Wow. Mm. Uh, and on top of this sand dune is this 60-foot monument they built um, to recognize the 25th anniversary of the first flight. And it's 60 feet tall. Wow. It just dominates everything. And uh, so we filmed there. And then I, I left the next morning for a 13-hour drive across North Carolina. I know Texas is a big state. North Carolina going from the east coast to the west corner <laughs> of North Carolina. It's 550 miles. That's a long way. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but I got to drive through the Smoky Mountains. I mean, just... Beautiful. The leaves were changing colors, driving next to the rivers. I mean, I'm like, this ain't West Texas. Yeah. <laughs> Toto, we ain't Kansas no more. <laughs> and uh, I get to uh, Huntsville. And so Huntsville, Alabama is home to the U.S. Space and Rocket Center. Um, it's where they tested the rockets that uh, the Saturn V uh, rockets to get us to the moon were tested. Mm. Um, and... Uh, I have seen the Saturn V before, but it's been so long since I've been to to NASA in Houston. I couldn't really put it into perspective how big that rocket is. They have a a uh, manufactured rocket outside, and then inside an actual rocket. This rocket is three hundred and sixty three feet tall. To put that into perspective, the Bank of America Tower across the park from us is three hundred and thirty two feet. Whoa. Dang. <laughs> Whoa. Okay. Um, and I'm like, they, they needed every foot of this to get us to the moon. Yeah. And so they have uh, on display the Apollo um, 16 command module. And it just happened to be that same day the uh, commander, I think of, I think he was a commander, of Apollo passed away. Same day. I'm like, wow, that's wow. A crazy coincidence. Um, but here, here's a funny story. This, this won't be in the documentary, but, um, so I, I got up that morning to go to the space and rocket center and doesn't up until nine, um, because I've been traveling, um, in the East coast and I'm now back in central time zone. I'm up an hour early. Uh, I'm like, I'll just go to breakfast at the hotel. Well, it's a small hotel with nothing more than just, you know, muffins and waffles. I'm like, there's a Denny's in the parking lot. I'll go to Denny's. I walk to Denny's. They're closed. Uh, plumbing issues. I'm like, well, there's a Waffle House two blocks over. I'll just go check out and go to Waffle House. <laughs> so I'm sitting there waiting on my order at Waffle House. I'm like, what's around me that I could drive to to waste another hour before getting to it? And I see around the corner from the hotel, there's a cemetery. And one of the Google Maps uh, dots is, here is the grave of Little Richard. Whoa. Oh. Okay. So I got done with my breakfast and I went and found Little Richard's gravesite <laughs> and, uh, and, and paid my respects uh, it's a little Richard. Nice. <laughs> um, That's and, awesome. And, uh, I mean, it's, it was very easy to find. I mean, it's right where it says on the map. Yeah. There's a big yellow um, rose heart uh, out front. Sure, it's very flamboyant. Like yeah, and people leave, you know, leaving things for little Richard right there. I'm like, well, you know, okay. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> um, and so then after that, I went to the U.S. Space and Rocket Center. And, and it's just cool to see. You know, you know I'm like... To think 66 years after the Wright brothers' first flight, we walked on the moon. Mm-hmm. Like, It's not a long time. It is not a long time. And to think, what have we done in the 66-plus years since then? Mm-hmm. It's nothing. <laughs> I'm like, what, what have we done? Now, I will say, you know, this year we actually sent civilians to space for the first time. And uh, so it's like, okay, 120 years after... And the Wright Brothers' first flight, we're, we're now sending civilians into space. So uh, we're getting closer and closer to real space exploration, uh, the way that I think everybody envisioned we yeah. would be at at this point in time. I, I'm still waiting for my Jetsons flying car. Uh, <laughs> I was going to ask. Yeah. You know, I mean, I just want Rosie. 
She pops yeah. out a little, little I, dinner. I, I need a, I need a Rosie that's just to clean my house. Right. <laughs> so, but, are you shopping this documentary? Are are um are you are you looking to you know uh, place to premiere it or? I I mean it, it's kind of an open door right now because originally the intention was this is just a a, a true video journal. Okay. Personal project. And just a personal project. Um, but I've had people reach out to me and say, hey, when you're ready to premiere this, like, we want we want to get you involved. Like, I've had people say, hey, we we're actually involved with film festivals in, you know, this place and this place. And and even Randy Hamm is kind of put in my ear like, hey, you know, what if we did a West Texas Film Festival? And would you want to run it? I'm like, uh. <laughs> <laughs> like, just because I created I a mean, documentary doesn't mean I'm not I'd, that busy. Yeah, why not? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I but, mean, I own the domain, so I mean, why not? Yeah, and it would be fun to do. Um, but I, I'm, I mean, it's kind of an, a a blank, uh, blank canvas of mm-hmm. what I want to do with it. Um, because when I, when I, the idea was, I'm doing this for myself. But at the same time, the idea of of letting other people view it, and, and you know, while it is. Uh, Heavily all around the themes of aviation, but there's also a lot of mental health component yeah, it's to very it. Personal, it could sure. be helpful for and, and so a lot for of people, people for a lot of people. I mean, there was a, a video I saw the other day um, that yeah, I think it was from Australia. It has been one of the most impactful uh, commercials around mental health, uh, in particular men's mental health. Um, it's been viewed like 50 million times, and so it's like two guys who show up to uh, a rugby event. One guy, he just sits there very kind of stoic. The other guy sitting next to him, just, I mean, he is a fan. He is engaged. And they look like two friends, but it shows them going to different games. One guy's always stoic. The other guy's always just very animated. And then it gets to the uh, a transition, and it's the stoic man just by himself. The other man who looked happy as can be, had taken their life. Mm-hmm. And it's like, you don't always see the signs. Yeah. And, uh, and and I think as men, we don't talk about our mental health enough. And so I'm like, if this is just an opportunity just to put a spotlight on men's mental health that, hey, we are human beings. We do sh- feel emotions and, and should talk about those emotions. And it's okay to talk about and, it. Yeah. And I mean, to have the feelings. I, I mean, yeah. There's emotions that I still don't like. In, in dealing with my divorce. Mm-hmm. They're not as intense as they used to be. You know, I don't find myself walking down the aisles at HEB just randomly tearing up like <laughs> like I used to. I'm like, why, why am I crying over a can of corn? <laughs> you know? <laughs> like it doesn't make any sense. But yeah. but grief doesn't, you yeah. know? And and I would talk to my therapist. I'm like, why? Why? She's like, just grief is weird sometimes. Mm-hmm. And you just have to process it however you need to process it. Whether that's talking about it with other people, doing something creative like a documentary, like or journaling or whatever that may be, whether you want to keep it to yourself or share it with others, like to me, I'm like, I just want to share. I just want to be able to make it open and, and have that conversation, and and uh, and you know, if it helps one person, then to me, then it was worth it. Absolutely, that's great. I uh, I commend you on that, man. I I think it's. I didn't know all the reasons why you're making this documentary. I knew that I knew that you were a big aviation fan, but um, you know the the personal side of it is it's. I think it's going to be really great, and I think it is going to help a lot of people. And uh, let us know if we can help promote it in any way or yeah. you know, anything like that. Um, yeah, I'm not I'm not sure what I want to do for a premiere or what that looks like. Yeah, yeah. You know, I thought well maybe I can premiere it at the CF, but that's a whole nother story. <laughs> I mean, I, I used to work there. And all the things that took place when they moved out of it, I'm like, I don't want to deal with them anymore. Sure. Um, I mean, I, I, the 2015 air show was kind of my uh, big moment. That's when we last had the Air Force Thunderbirds. Mm-hmm. And I was their public safety liaison. And, and uh, I'm like, there's nothing that's going to top this. <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> this is my swan song. And I'm out. Yeah. And uh, but. Uh, so many callbacks to Vegas. It's crazy. Yeah. What yeah. do you know? What do you know? No, I mean, well, Small you mean, world. I mean, we, I mean, that's uh, as a kid, that was my dream job. I wanted to be the commander. I wanted to be at Nellis. I wanted to be in Vegas. Um, it's always, I'm like, I'm sorry, I'm going. Yeah. And, uh, and, uh, life had other plans. Sure. 
I do appreciate you inviting me to do one scene in your documentary. Where, now, Tara, you didn't know about this, but we actually um, we recreated the uh, beach volleyball scene from Top Gun. Yep. Uh, we, I've never seen Top Gun. <laughs> I haven't seen 90% of the movies out there. You know, I think I have seen it, but I don't remember. Oh, we have some work to do. <laughs> yeah, we'll clip that in. I'm sure Tom Cruise would be really happy with that. Um, is there I'm anything? I'm sure it was excellent. It was excellent. It was excellent. Um, is there anything else that you wanted to promote, man? I know you're kind of, to me, you're kind of the uh, the podcast veteran of, yeah. uh, of this area. Yeah, and we even talked about the podcast that I do. I've got Leaders and Loggers, which was really created to, to talk about leadership development uh, in, a, in a very easy way. Like, I always felt the best conversations were shared over a meal or a beer. And uh, and so, you know. Kudos. Um, Thanks, Tall City. It, it was just I wanted I wanted to learn to be a better leader on my own, so I wanted to talk to leaders, um, and so I was like, well, let's do it where it's a different craft beer every episode, uh, and let's talk to people. and And I've had some amazing guests. Um, I mean, we're sitting here; it's, we're recording on Veterans Day, and I've had number of veterans. I mean, the, the most downloaded episode was Dave Cooper, who was the senior enlisted operator of SEAL Team Six during oh, wow. the Bin Laden raid. And the Captain Phillips Rescue. Dang. Wow. Um, he was on my podcast. Uh, I had a Thunderbird pilot on my podcast. That was That's my personal favorite episode. <laughs> um, we did actually release that one on my birthday um, of 2021. And uh, and I've had n- a number of other uh, people. I mean, I've had New York Times bestsellers. I've had, um, I mean, just CEOs. So many really cool people. And... Um, and then the the other one that I host is uh, called P's and Q's, a short for pints and questions. I got, I got definitely s- theme here. There's I'm, a I'm theme here. there. I I have become uh, the unofficial uh, benefits bartender. Is <laughs> 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 kind of because that I mean what I do for a living. And, and I have a LinkedIn newsletter called the Benefits Brews Letter, um, and it, it plugs a different craft beer every every week too. And but. Uh, yeah, I've got, and then I, I host or produce a third one, uh, the Investor Professor podcast with Dr. Oh, yeah. Ryan Peckham. Oh yeah, I've uh, I just happened to stumble uh, across that one day, and I was like, "Hey, it's Dr. Peckham." Yeah, yeah, like, he was my my college professor when he was at Midland College before okay. he before he moved on, uh, and uh, and he's killing it. With, How do you like uh, hosting versus producing? You know, he makes it very easy to produce. He's got a great team behind it. He just sends it to me. And, and really, it's not even that. He's like, I'll just upload it. Mm. Um, and I just host it, really, at this point. Um, I like the hosting component because I like talking to people. Yeah, I like just having those conversations. Sure. And, uh, and just being able to sit through and just learn. Learn, learn from those, those experiences. So, um, you know, the podcast, you know, we've... When I, it took a two-year break, and it's now back again, um, and we've got about a dozen episodes already r- recorded that won't come out on a weekly basis. Nice. Um, some that are really, really uh, incredible. Um, I've got coming up to record uh, the former COO of Taco Bell. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, she's got a book coming out, <clears throat> and uh, so she she's uh, said that she's want to come and, and talk about um, – about the book and, and whatnot. And uh, we got a couple on mental health uh, as well. Just Good. like I wanted to talk to some of those people just for my own <laughs> personal sense. I'm like, well, how do we relate this back to leadership? So we mm-hmm. got those as well. Um, and then I think the big thing that uh, you'll see in 2024, um, you know, we've talked about maybe Midland Odessa kind of has grown to this point where I, I, gotten to be more involved with the city and whatnot and and there are people who wanting me to run for office and so um that's going to probably become a reality okay uh, just don't tell everybody you're going to raise taxes immediately uh yeah (laughs) not not (laughs) here to raise taxes but let's let's have um practical conversations sure Mm -hmm. that's awesome that sounds that sounds great i think uh i think it's a smart move i mean even before i got to to know you, I was like, man, this guy must be super connected. I mean, um, and you kind of have to be, right. right? I mean, 
But and it, if you didn't start out that way, you've certainly yeah. Now for I mean, sure. Now, now everybody knows who I am. Yeah. And uh, and it, it it took a while to to kind of gain the the notoriety or or uh, infamy, <laughs> depending on <laughs> on who who you talk to. Right. Um. And uh, where it's like, okay, how do I how do I just continue that process of how do I leave Midland better than I found it? Yeah. It's awesome, man. I really appreciate you coming on to that. I mean, like like you were saying, like your guests and th- stuff, it was just like we love to learn about people, you know, and, and sort of hear their story and, and see how, you know, sort of relate to what we've been through. You know what I mean? And sort of like is there um, is there sort of some shared experiences there? Yeah. And uh, really look up to you in terms of the things that you – the positivity you've brought to this area. And, again, especially in that – the podcast world. I mean, I was like, yeah, this guy's great. Um, and I hope that you have a very prosperous 2024. Um, and let's, let's grab lunch sometimes, grab coffee sometime. Yeah. I, wanna, I wanna pick or your beer. brain on a couple things or beers. Yes, of yeah. course. <laughs> yeah. Coffee, get out of here. Um, I want to pick your brain on a lot of things, but I mean, we can obviously bring that off of the podcast, but, um, yeah, I'd love to, We'd love to know more of what you're, what you're involved with, or, or um, essentially how we can help um, promote both cities um, in any way we can. I mean, that's the whole point of Best of Midland. Yeah. Um, so yeah, just let us know. And uh, is there anything else you want? Well, spill spill a beer. Down. Party foul. How many Party do you foul. have? That's my seventeenth one. <laughs> <laughs> Um, been here a while. Before I wrap this up, I mean, is there anything else you wanted to push? Obviously, all of your links and, and, yeah. uh, are going to be in the description. Make sure you follow Kevin. Man, you're big on LinkedIn, man. I got to pick your brain about LinkedIn. Yeah, LinkedIn. LinkedIn is where I do a lot of a lot of my stuff. Now, I, I mean, outside of uh, maybe Midland Odessa, like my Facebook, my Instagram, they're growing, but LinkedIn has become really where I've 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 lived because the people that I want to connect with, right? That's where they are. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I need to. I need to tap your brain a little bit on that. I, I, LinkedIn for me is very underutilized because, you know, back in the day, I guess, it was just a place when you were looking for a job. It's, it? it has shifted so much. It. Now you know, it's I an got, actual communication tool. It, so. it is a communication tool. And I tell people all the time, especially in the sales world, like it, in sales, the ABCs are always be closing. Mm-hmm. But there's a new set of ABCs. Always be creating. Mm-hmm. Oh, I like that. Well, just found the title of this episode. Um <laughs> All right, man. Listen, uh, really appreciate you coming in today. Like I said, follow Kevin and uh, all the links are below. I'm really excited to uh, hear more about the documentary as you're probably entering the editing stages and things like that. And so keep you all um, keep you all up to date on those releases and things like that. And so um, there's nothing else. I have to pee. Let's go crack some more beers. All right. I have to pee. That's <laughs> keep that in. All right. No. We'll see you on the next one. Bye.